<coughs> Thank you. Extremely interesting project and presentations. Um, I think I agree really with Greg, but which is that the missing, um, miss well, it's not a missing agent. It's very active in, in your analysis, civic society, but it's not deconstructed. And where it comes from, what it is, is going to be hugely influential. And you sort of unraveled a little bit as you talked that you were really talking about trade union movements. You might have added rural workers, and they are very powerful, but you could have many other different types of movements. And so I feel that before one can come to conclusions about the, you know, how one influences political parties, one has to understand what is this civic society that one's talking about? What are the constituents? How did it emerge? When does it emerge? And then move on to political parties. Can you just identify yourself? Oh, sorry. I'm Francis Stewart from Oxford. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sheila Page, ODI. Um, I'd also like to take up the civil society point because there seem to be uh, two different things that are being said in Nick's presentation about parties which b start and then reach out to uh, civil society and parties which are based on civil society and whether civil society, in a sense, formed the party. And I think these are quite different things. And a lot of what you were saying seems to apply to the, the second. That's, that's when you get the structures of the civil society mm. going over into the party and possibly producing the institutionalization that you want. Whereas the first is a rather different model, but that seemed to be what you, where you start. And I just wanted you to clarify that. And second, on your policy recommendations, uh, the idea that some outsider, you, you just said we, I wasn't quite sure who we were, uh, should identify gaps. That strikes me as incredibly dangerous. I mean, if you were doing that for the UK at the moment, you might well identify the sort of gap that the EDL has I evolved to uh, represent, if you like. And I'm not sure one would want necessarily to support that sort of party in other places. At least I wouldn't, which is why I'm not sure who we is. And more specifically, I really do not think an outsider should be doing this possibly helping a civil society to develop the mechanisms to develop a party, to come back to my first point, but actually going in and saying, uh, there's no one opposing the Chinese at the moment, let's help the Zambians develop a party to do that, uh, strikes me as going rather beyond normal international relations. Thank you, Sheena. Can you pass the microphone to the gentleman? Thank you. Oh. Hello, I'm, uh, my name is Dan Paget. I co-authored the report uh, with Nick and I'm at Oxford. Um, I'd like to address my question to Greg and I'd like to pick up where the last uh, questioner left off and ask, uh, given some of our findings regarding the potential importance of uh, re reconnect or connecting or reconnecting um, some civil society organizations or parties, um, what role do you think there could be for um, party assistance providers given their um, sensitive outsider positions? Thank you, Dan. And I think the gentleman in the back also had a question. Thank you very much for the most informative uh, presentations. I am Khalid Mubarak. I'm media counselor at the Embassy of the Sudan in London. I have two questions, if I may. One to Dr. Nick Chisman. It's about uh, you refer to the uh, systems of party systems in the United States and in this country, which is uh, very relevant because they are looked up to by us in the developing countries. But don't you think a comparative uh, uh, approach in this respect could also be useful, for example, that these two party systems are facing challenges of uh, uh, reduced uh, uh, contribution from the population in voting in the, the lobby system and the corruption and uh, uh, finances by uh, billionaires and this sort of thing. Don't you think this is relevant also? My question to Dr. Power is about civil society. When you have civil society which is uh, established and financed by Western embassies and, uh, and it's encouraged to play a role in the local politics among the political parties and in the political landscape, <coughs> Uh, don't you think that's uh, dangerous and problematic? Thank you very much. Okay, lastly, can we pass the microphone to Dilia? Thank you. Hi, thanks. I'm Delia Lloyd from BBC Media Action. Thank you for the presentation. And also, I thought the discussions were fantastic, so well done. Um, I, wanna, I think I want to kind of integrate a lot of the comments because they also 
go to what I was reacting to, which is, I think the mo there's something wrong with the model. And I think the problem is you're treating parties as, forgive the jargon, exogenous. You start with this idea of the parties as somehow these things that exist and then have relationships with, in this case, ethnic groups and civil society organizations. When I, I would start where Greg started, which is, what is a political party? Just a bunch of people, often guys, sitting around in a country trying to achieve an objective. They decide strategically that this particular institutional mechanism is the most effective thing for getting what they want, in this case, maximizing votes. And they choose the party, to, they, they, ch they, and they, they, they do that the best that they can. I, I think, hearing all these comments, that for you to, 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 to get at, you're, it seems like you're mostly interested in how do we know under what conditions political parties produce good governance outcomes in some settings and bad in others. I think you want to start with who those people are and what they want. And I would start, rather than having them have these relationships, start with who, who are the people who form these things. My guess in some of the countries you're looking at, they are ethnic groups with certain interests. They might be trade unions, so break down, break down whatever the cleavages are. I think Reese made really useful, com um, is it Reese? Sorry. The Reese. Yeah, Reese. observations about the different cleavages you could come up with, and the audience has, has talked about um, ways of, of, of breaking down what you mean by CSOs, but I would start there, and then I would move forward and think about under a host of different settings what kinds of outcomes you get, and I think your outcome is actually what's a political, I think you're explaining different kinds of party systems or different kinds of political parties. And then I would, I would add, at the very end, the institutional constraints. So how the rules, if there are no rules in your story, and they need to be there, right? So is it separation of power system? Is it first past the post? Is it, is it someone mentioned, you know, a list? What kind of party list system? I would, I would add those at the end. So stop taking the parties, I know that you've written the book, but for round two, <laughs> stop taking the parties for granted. They are what you're explaining. And let me just, the last thing I'm gonna say, because I'm from the BBC, I'm required to talk about the media. I would not assume the media is necessarily a good thing either. And I'm saying that as a member of the BBC. Treat the media as a political actor with its own interests, just like any of these other things we're talking about, and see how it inserts into your model. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. That, that's a very rich set of questions, and I think if I can try to give each of the panelists about two minutes to, to <laughs> <laughs> answer, we can have another round, hopefully. Um, maybe we can start in reverse order. So maybe, Greg, I will um, you. turn to you, and then we go to Luis, uh, Jorge. That, and can I just ask Dan, just to clarify the question, because I wasn't sure I understood it, exactly what you were asking me to comment. Uh, in short, uh, the question is that, that, um, that there are benefits when parties are formed based on civil society movements or they form relationships with them later. Much in the way that, the British, for example, the British Labour Party has relations with the trade unions. Okay. Um, is there any role for party assistance providers to facilitate those links at any stage okay. in party development from Genesis onwards? Okay, thanks. thanks. Um, I, I should start by thanking um, Dr. M Mubarak for the invitation to condemn Western Party aid for civil society. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate the invitation. I'm not going to do that. Um, uh, I think, but I think it is, uh, both of these questions I'll try and tie together. Um, it is uh, a very contentious area. Um, uh, I have a problem with the way that international uh, political assistance has developed over the last 20 years because it has largely seen s support for civil society as a substitute for working with political parties. Um, uh, and there's been this assumption that you can, that a, that a democracy, a political system can work you know, with a, a functioning civil society but avoided political parties. The, the approach to political parties is still very contentious, as it is with civil society as well. Um, a lot of donors, uh, many of whom we work with, are very sensitive to accusations of interfering in the sovereign politics of, a, of another nation. Um, but I think there is a role. There is a role for um, international assistance uh, in strengthening civil society and in strengthening political parties. The answer to this question is I'm, I'm not entirely sure um, uh, the best point of entry, um, but I think the role of uh, international assistance is to ensure that there is a, um, a, I'm trying to avoid a cliche here, but it is to do with levelling the, 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 the playing field, so that there is the, the incentives to electoral competition are there, so that you have a, an electoral competition which isn't distorted by you know, 
incredible dominance of one political party or you know e extreme fragmentation on the other. Um, but I think donors, international donor agencies, implementing agencies need to recognise that what they are doing is political. It is, by definition, very, very sensitive. And you have to be, you have to go into that knowing that if you are, you know, if you're trying to strengthen democracy, ultimately you are acting politically because it assumes there isn't enough accountability or transparency or scrutiny. If you're trying to achieve that, then you are taking some power away from the, the executive and putting it elsewhere. All right. Uh, Luis, uh, over to yes. you. And yeah. Uh, well, I mean, first I would say that uh, you, I mean, it, 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 this is one of the traps we often fall into. It is impossible to take the politics out of politics. And so invariably when you are working with political actors, you are going to be imputed with political motivations um, regardless of, uh, of what the, the actual situation may be. And furthermore, uh, it is not the situation where in most cases in development we are walking into a situation where parties don't exist. In fact, in most cases, the table is already set. We know who the political players are, and those political players may change over time and evolve. But you are working in a in a shifting context, and that it's if you're lucky. I mean, just as an example, NDI has been in Georgia since 1994. We've seen now, you know, the 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 rise and fall of three uh, separate presidents and the transformation of the country from a presidential to a parliamentary system and. Uh, you know the first uh, electoral transfer of power over the last over the past year. Obviously, development uh, in this context can be viewed as an overall success, or it can simply be viewed in the context of uh, the nation's uh, aspirations for Euro integration and membership in the EU and NATO. And so, that requires, in some respect, a fast forwarding. And the the the, the, the degree to which that fast forwarding takes place is in is entirely in the, the hands of those people who are uh, both the voters and, and those that those that they elect. Uh, going to this question about uh, civil society, I mean, civil society takes a lot of forms. There is, there's partisan civil society, there's nonpartisan civil society. And I think that in terms of uh, development, the, the goal uh, we try, uh, we, uh, I'm not talking about NDI here, but I think in my experience in uh, in, in the past four and a half years in, in, uh, as an implementer on this matter, uh, we, we tend to try to um, create firewalls, if you will, and promote those civil society organizations which have an agenda that is not, certainly as it, uh, does not have as its primary intention the advocacy or the support for a particular political agenda or particular political party, although there are actors in civil society who clearly uh, have those aspirations. With regards to the, the uh, question by the, the gentleman from the embassy of the Sudan, I mean, again, just as you cannot take politics out of politics, this question about money versus administrative resources versus uh, movement politics and movement politics, you know, tend to be about identity uh, in one form or another or uh, the desire to redress uh, social grievances of one form or another class or otherwise. And these are always going to be competing factors and when you add an international component to this, again, uh, the, the, the default position is to accuse the international actors of either picking winners and losers or accentuating the opportunities uh, among individual players. And I think that, you know, frankly, uh, if you look at the history of uh, uh, Western Europe and the United States, there are clearly cases where that has uh, been, a, uh, been a mistake and been a function of those larger powers politics. And there are, you know, presumably in, in a recent period, uh, I, I won't go so far as to say altruistic, but certainly a more constructive uh, 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 perspective taken towards these things. And so, you know, again, I think, you know, to, to the last point about the, the, the point from the BBC, uh, for us to, to drill down too far on this question of who the individual players are, in fact, sort of works counter to what presumably development assistance of, is about, which is institutional development as opposed to the personalization of politics. Again, you know, in most of these places, the table is already set in terms of who political actors are, and the only question is their ability to utilize the, presumably, the, the tactics and the, uh, the, the mindset 
and the mindset in particular, I think, of trying to connect issues to electoral success as opposed to money or personality or administrative resources, which are transitory uh, at best, although they certainly do pay dividends for any number of people who utilize them. Um, and that, you know, in as much as um, uh, we work with the media, again, I think the, 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 the issue here um, is less about what is the particular agenda of a given media entity, because you are correct, media entities, particularly in developing uh, emerging democracies, are, are often uh, as personality and partisan based as, as other actors. The question becomes really about access uh, for citizens and for citizens to have the greatest uh, level of um, connection so that you know, invariably, as imperfect as it may be, it is nevertheless more organic to empower citizens to have more information in order to hopefully shape the decisions and the choices that they'll make in terms of electoral politics. Thank you, Luis. Uh, Jorge, two minutes. Uh, even less than that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I basically agree with um, this because that's actually what we try to do when extracting implications from the research. I mean, not to think about, or, or not only about, I mean, as democracy assistance provider, but rather as politician, no? what, what is up to? I mean, what is, as, as, as Greg said, I mean, they might be, they, they want to know what is good for attracting votes. I mean, basically, that's the immediate short-term uh, need they have. And, and, but, but I think this research actually has a lot to say about that, I mean, to answer that specific question. Um, because, I mean, well, of course, the argument that uh, appealing to pragmatic messages or, and of course, without, I mean, recognizing at the same time that clientelism, patronage, identity, charisma, etc., do play a role in politics, and that's unavoidable. But, I mean, how do you do that other thing, I mean, engaging with policies in a meaningful way to voters is, uh, is still a va very valid question that, uh, I mean, can be uh, addressed by different ways. And of course, politicians themselves in the first place, and democracy assistance providers can do something as well. I mean, it's cheaper. That's, I mean, that's something that, uh, uh, that we shouldn't um, um, lose sight of. Uh, it's, it's much cheaper and cleaner, of course, to, to use this type of strategies. And, and, and we might have some good examples of that. I mean, long-term, uh, uh, opposition leaders, I mean, that being on the opposition for, for long term, can tell you about this, I mean, two, I'm mean, sorry, 10, 15 years of being waiting for accessing to government, that, I mean, the strategy came to, to, to fruition. I mean, I'm a bit optimistic, and I probably I'm sounding, a bit, uh, I sound a bit naive, but, uh, but still, I think it, might, it does make sense. I mean, we can do, look in retrospect now and, and see that these strategies can also speak meaningfully to politicians and, and, and not only them, but also voters. And of course, by implication, and I'm sure uh, Nick is going to now tackle the questions on civil society, also to civil society organizations. Thank you, you have Thanks. two minutes to address all I'm, that. <laughs> I may need the rest of his two minutes. Um, thank you very much for the helpful questions. I guess, I mean, the first thing I should say is, I mean, maybe I didn't say it enough, that what we tried to present was a simplified, boiled down version of a very long set of case studies. Um, and so defend, I would also, I'd like to thank our authors of the case studies who aren't here. Um, but to defend them, in the summary, you know, everything that everyone's mentioned is dealt with in incredible detail <laughs> in the 150 <laughs> pages. Um, but in the space of 10 minutes, it's, it's not that easy. Let me rattle for a few things. Um, on ethnic programmatic parties and is the, does the PT have an ethnic component? Of course it does, absolutely. And one of the things we try and do in the paper is exactly that, to put back on the table that some of the classic programmatic parties have an ethnic element. So I, we completely agree with you and that's what we're trying to do here. When I put those things down on the screen, it was explicitly as ideal types to help us think about the types of categories and what it might mean to help policymakers like IDEA and others to get a kind of clear cut understanding of the different trajectories as a sort of heuristic device. But of course, what we're trying to do in the paper is point out there's a long spectrum and there's a lot of um, different combinations that exist along it. But it's also interesting, you pointed out blacks voting for the Democratic Party. 
that's very different in some ways to what's going on in Zambia because, of course, blacks haven't always voted for the Democratic Party. So it's not that that's been a built-in constituency from the very beginning in the way it has, for example, with the PF. Blacks, of course, historically supporting the Republican Party. In terms of the point many people made about civil society, I would say, I mean, A, we don't make any of the generalizations or reductionist assumptions people have suggested. So, Francis, we're not talking about trade unions. So if it came across that way, it's probably just because I know the Zambian case better. We're also talking about rule-based societies and organizations. Sometimes these may be traditional forms of associations. Sometimes they may be local insurance mechanisms or economic associations. Other times they might be trade unions. They might be other forms of ethnic associations. So there's a broad variety of these kinds of organizations. So we're not making that assumption. We fully recognize that in many cases, we're talking about civil society groups that have antagonistic relationships to the state. But I think it's very important to make it very clear that in almost every country you can go to, you see a set of what we might think of the Amnesty International Transparency Organizations that have that relationship, and a set of trade union type organizations, partisan organizations that are deeply involved in everyday politics. And every country that we could go to, I think, and think about established political systems, we'll see very strong relationships between civil society and parties. So I was slightly surprised that people were can, people were worried about the idea that civil society and parties might work together. I mean, that's the historical experience in all of the countries we're talking about. So let's let's not lose sight of that. I'm going to have to wrap up in just a minute. So um, on terms of Greg's excellent point about incentives, Greg, you're absolutely right, um, clearly. What I would say there, though, is that you know one of the things we need to be explaining to political parties, and I try and do this when I do similar work to you in Africa, is that they lose 85% of elections, right? The opposition in Africa loses 85% of the time. So their strategy is not working. And you can't outspend an incumbent on clientelism. It just doesn't work unless you've got, you know, an external George Soros backer and the incumbent party has a massive crisis of resources. You have to find another way. And most of the cases of transfer of power in Africa have come from programmatic parties or parties that try and form a more programmatic base or, as Chloe was talking about, some kind of crisis. So I do think there's a clear actual incentive here for them to rethink their strategies. It's a cheaper, more effective way of mobilizing. Not in all countries, and as we say, <coughs> the structural conditions may make it impossible to get this stuff off the ground, so we need to be realistic and we need to be context-specific. Um, and unfortunately, Uganda, the oil money means Museveni's going nowhere. Um, in terms of should we be doing this, that's a great question. You have to remember that we were employed by International Idea on a research <laughs> grant to advise them on how to do this. So although we fed back a number of times you know, our concerns and our thoughts about the ways this could be counterproductive, from the point of view of the published report, we were operating to a mandate, and the mandate was to discuss how this could be done. Um, but of course we share your concerns. No one is talking about going into countries and identifying things like the EDL opportunity, for example. Um, clearly not. What we're talking about is going in and helping organizations and parties to see the types of things that they might do in order to, for example, tap into pro-poor policies that would appeal to a poor constituency. Should we be doing that? Perhaps not. I would have some sympathy for that view. But I don't think that's any more intrusive than anything else we're doing. You know, it's no more intrusive than the economic advice given by the IMF, the World Bank, for example. It's no more intrusive than. And what needs to be done is to do that in a way that parties are asking for it. Right? We need to have relationships with parties where we can say to them, what is it that you're looking for? And if they say, well, actually, we're interested in finding out more about what people think and what policies might be effective, which many parties are. They come to me and ask for advice on opinion polling, for example. We can say, well, we can use an opinion poll and we can find out what issues are out there that you might be able to tap into. No different to what any political party does in advanced democracy, many of whom use international consultants to generate the same kind of findings. Um, very finally, Delia. Um, I think maybe I didn't present this bit quite right. We're trying to do exactly what you said. We're trying to show where parties come from. And we're trying to simplify that down by instead of talking about personalities, because if we do that, every party becomes sort of individual and very difficult to sort of explain in a more generalizable way. We're trying to do that by looking at these different choices that parties make. So it's explicitly about starting with the party and saying, why does Michael Sada do what he does? He does what he does because he sees this constituent, he sees that one, and then he gets involved. So then we get these different actors involved at the very beginning. And then what does that mean for the way those parties develop? But at the same time, I think it's important that the institutions and everything else comes in there. 
because the choices these leaders make, and Greg's right on this point completely, matter depending on the electoral system. Is it first past the post, so you need to go and get good candidates, or is it party list, and so you need to mobilise in a different way? So we are trying to do what you said, and I think you're absolutely right. And hopefully if you um, at some point have the opportunity to wade through the 150 papers, you'll see all of that rich description and that discussion of the contextual decisions, which we're trying to represent here in a sense of a couple of choices. Okay, um, thank you so much. As the sole woman representative in this panel, I think I'm going to um, resort to some strong men party politics and um, ask you to uh, bear around for a second round of questions, if, if I may. And um, I will take the first one. <laughs> um, I re well, there are a couple of things that I just wanted to uh, hopefully get some insights from the different panelists. The first one is that one of the things that struck me about the Kichel research project is that there is something about clientelistic parties where they can deliver for development. And if we assume that most parties in the developing world are bound to be clientelistic, based on what uh, some of the conversation we've had, had here today. What is it that can be done to harness clientelism towards a more developmental um, objective? So that's the first one. And then the second one, really taking advantage of the fact that we have Luis um, in Georgia, who, who obviously is overseeing uh, NDI's work there. I wonder if you can reflect a little bit on the real implications that emerge from what has been discussed here about the kind of support to political parties that is likely uh, to be required to be effective. Um, Greg has made a very powerful point about the fact that this is all very political work. Um, Jorge has mentioned that a lot of it is bound to be conflict orientated and actually there has to be a toleration for that kind of messy politics. Um, Nick was talking about the need to support perhaps non-obvious political parties that might be smaller. So I wonder from a programmatic perspective sitting in a country office, what does this mean? Okay, I think I may have to, you yeah, want me I to, may start? Have to close the floor. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I didn't realize you wanted me to start. Uh, well, I mean, obviously, uh, just in the last two years, we've seen uh, the emergence of a new uh, political party, political entity, the Georgian Dream uh, Party and Georgian Dream Coalition, which was headed up by the billionaire uh, uh, Bidzini Ivanishvili, who is now, after just a year in office, intends to step down as prime minister. So uh, a very lightning uh, like presence uh, with uh, dramatic results. Uh, but the work that has been done uh, through NDI and IRI and other um, international groups has been largely within the framework of those political parties that existed uh, before the Georgian Dream Coalition uh, was developed, but in part a uh, function of the fact that there are multiple parties within the Georgian Dream Coalition. So parties uh, such as uh, the Republicans, Free Democrats, Conservatives, uh, National Forum, uh, just to name a few within the Georgian Dream Coalition, who had uh, been uh, uh, the beneficiaries of, of international development support, uh, continued to receive that support, even though their uh, context had changed from individual aspiration to a coalition aspiration. Uh, the same is true for the ruling party, United National Movement. And the, the transition of the United National Movement from being a party in control of all levers of power at every level of government uh, to now being uh, reduced to the loyal opposition and the largest opposition faction within parliament. And so even, you know, just in the last two years, you've seen a tremendous transition uh, in terms of this development work and, and you know, how a new party uh, develops, emerges, and, and reacts. I think, you know, in terms of our political... Uh, our, our support for parties specifically um, has been largely within the context of strategic communications and that has been mostly uh, assisted through public survey research which has been funded by the Swedish International Development Agency. And for anyone who's interested, you can look up all the polls that we have conducted since 2010 online at ndi.org. Uh, but the, the point of this polling has been uh, sort of threefold. Number one, uh, to provide an opportunity for citizens uh, through a public presentation of polling to see their attitudes reflected in the public sphere. Number two, to help political parties see the connection and the, between uh, current events and the, the performance of government to electoral interests. And number three, uh, to try and, and help people understand that uh, there really is something called undecided voters. Uh, and that if you, you know, because a lot of political parties start off with the assumption that everyone believes a certain way, 
And uh, whether or not uh, I win is simply a function of whether or not my voters were, were allowed to fully participate, as opposed to the notion that, well, in fact, uh, you have to compete for voters uh, and that there are a variety of ways in which that has to occur. Um, uh, with regards to the point about conflict and infrastructure, though, I think, you know, to your point uh, earlier, I think that's absolutely correct. You know, again, you cannot take the politics out of politics. Politics, by definition, is a confrontational uh, uh, sport at, at, at a minimum. Uh, and so um, the, the biggest challenge, and we've certainly experienced that here in, uh, in Georgia, is uh, becoming a, a political football at times because uh, either you're transparent in, in the work that you do or because the work that you do impacts political players. I think that you know this is sort of a, a precursor to the notion that if you are going to get involved in political party development, you know by definition you run the risk of becoming part of the political narrative. Uh, that does not mean that you should not help to develop uh, infrastructure, and the and that infrastructure is primarily predicated on the notion that the success of any political party, of any governmental institution within a democracy, is a function of its ability to connect with voters at a fundamental level. And, and how that how those fundamentals are defined will uh, evolve over time from the clientelistic uh, uh, model to hopefully a more representative uh, model. And I think that's what all of this is about. Nick, do you have any final um, thoughts on what I asked? Just just on your point about clientelism, I mean, goes back to Greg's excellent point about the, you know the value of constituency based representation. There's been a big debate in the literature the last 20 years about should Africa have first past the post, should it have PR, and all the rest. Um, and it's a very interesting debate. I agree with Greg that in many cases, what you see is that you need first past the post to allow people in rural areas and other marginalized areas to have a pull on the center. This is the opportunity to get elected an MP who will represent you, who will bring back resources and will link you into other sources of development. And it would be really bad to denude these systems of that. It would, in a sense, cut off people who are otherwise don't have much interaction with the central state. So I think what we'd be looking at is something like a mixed system, like the German system, that would have perhaps a top-up of PR from a party list, but would also maintain constituency-based representation to keep that linkage to the rural areas, um, particularly where people often feel you know, the MP is their kind of welfare state, he's their representative. There is a danger with this, of course, and the, the fact that the MP becomes the focal point of development and the sort of welfare state providing both funds for school fees and funerals, as well as helping with local development, reinforces and institutionalizes big man politics and patrimonial politics at that level. And that, that's the tension we have to deal with. To me, having looked at the history of this in two or three countries, I think you know it's, it's sort of the three C's. It's about coordination, corruption, and capacity. So you know, coordination is if we have really sort of decentralized development going on through MPs at the local level, is it well coordinated? Do we get the services we need or do we get a very sort of strange array of services across the country? Is there enough central planning? The corruption one is that, you know, port barrel politics can work well and it can be non-corrupt as in the United States. It can have inefficiencies, but it can be non-corrupt. I mean, I'm not saying the US is non-corrupt, <laughs> but I'm, I'm drawing a comparison here from Nigeria, Kenya and the United States and I'll tell you which one I'd rather live in. So it doesn't have to be that way. But it, we need to think about if we're going to put the emphasis on that and work with that, what are the ways of reducing the corruption that might generate from, for example, constituents starting to expect MPs to provide development, mm -hmm. in which case the demands on MPs become unrealistic, which forces MPs to look for alternative sources of funds. And the final one is capacity. You know, do we actually find that those MPs have the capacity to actually deliver on those demands? And that requires coordination between them and the central state. So you can do things like in Kenya and other countries in Africa which have a constituency development fund principally to harness that local level representation. But we know from the reports of the CDF that often what's provided is fairly low quality and that a lot of corruption is involved in the tendering of those projects. So in a sense, it's a double-edged sword. It's great in terms of it engages people in political systems, but it does have problems in terms of the quality of service delivery and the other kinds of practices that it generates. Thank you. Um, there, there was just one, yeah, one point before we finish that I wanted to pick up on, which relates to what, what Nick was saying earlier um, uh, about not being able to, to outspend an incumbent. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that, you know, that's obviously a, a big difficulty, and especially where there is oil money. Um, Unless you're a billionaire. <laughs> but, 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 the, With all the money. but the bigger difference is that um, the partisan, 
it's it's the, the bigger I think challenge for something like the NRM, for example, is mm. not from the opposition parties, which are highly disorganised. Mm. I'm not sure they do any better in government than, than the NRM. It's the fragmentation in the NRM itself. Mm. And patronage politics means not only that you dominating other parties, but also keeping control Absolutely. of your own party and yeah. using that patronage to instil discipline right. and cohesion. Now that's, I think, the biggest challenge. Mm. And I think it's helpful for us to think not of parties as monolithic uh, um, organisations. They are, I think, as Sheila said, you know, swirling coalitions mm -hmm. um, which change over time. And I think those can be exploited mm -hmm. to try and challenge the dominance of very clientelistic parties and <coughs> encourage programmatic parties. Jorge, any final remarks? No? Well, I'm just looking at the, it's actually yes. 10 minutes last. Sorry, mo most on British for me, but uh, of me. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but uh, this uh, really does show that this is a, a tremendously interesting um, topic of, of conversation and engagement and debate. And I'm really, really sorry that we have not only run out of time but gone over. And so that means I cannot acknowledge the, the few questions that we have gotten from our audience outside. So sorry about that. Just before um, I let you go, please note that as Nick and Jorge were saying, this. Uh, a lot of what they said draws on very extensive research that has become available and is online um, on the IDEA page and also there is a link to that on the ODI page. And uh, if you enjoyed today's discussion, uh, we very much hope to see you at the next uh, installment of our event series on elections and democracy, which will happen on 11 December from 2 to 4. And that is going to be another thought-provoking topic on dirty money in politics. So we welcome you uh, to that event. Thank you very much.